that's enough of that stuff. <laughs> All right, welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship this morning. Today we're going to talk about carnival preachers. So I just had to put that little song in there. That's Entry of the Gladiators. Of course, it's been used by P.T. Barnum and Bailey and Sons. And, uh, of course, the famous thing there that they said, uh, Barnum said, was that uh, a sucker is born every minute. <laughs> okay, he was about getting the people in and getting their money. And unfortunately, there's a lot of churches that are the same way. Okay, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. One of the best ways for con men, con preachers, to con the people in a congregation is to change the level of their voice. All right, we're going to be looking at some examples of that today in this sermon here. Now, the word carnival. What does the word carnival mean? Where did it come from? Well, if you look it up, there are basically two different origins of this word. Okay, the first one is Catholic, believe it or not. You know, it shouldn't be too hard for you to believe that it's a Catholic uh, word, basically. And it comes from carne and veil. So you got carnal vol. And it means flesh removal or farewell to the flesh. And back centuries ago, they would have this thing called a carnival where they would actually put down their flesh. And for a Catholic, that doesn't mean giving up certain things necessarily. A lot of times the Catholics will actually beat themselves. They'll crawl around on their knees, their bare knees on pavement. I mean, they're, they're very, very weird that way. I mean, you know, their, their religion, religion is based around human sacrifice, eating the flesh and drinking blood. So why not, you know, beat yourself up? But uh, many Catholics do put down their flesh. But you see, they do it for salvation, which is wrong. Okay, you putting down your flesh is not going to get you to heaven. All right, you have to get saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. The other uh, origin of the word carnival is Italian, and it comes from carne and lavare. Another word there, Latin words. And lavare can also mean flesh removed or flesh raised. Now, think about that one. And I believe that that's the true definition of a carnival. What a carnival is. It's a raising of the flesh. Elevation of the flesh. It's a flesh show is what a carnival is. And a lot of churches today are carnivals. They are about the flesh. A bunch of immodestly dressed women up front singing songs that are, that are fleshly, that have a beat to them. And people saying... I want this and I feel that and I, you know, it's all about themselves. The average modern Christian doesn't care anything about what the Bible says. And you say, well, then this is about modern Christians today. No, not necessarily. You see, there are Baptist churches, there are quote unquote conservative churches, which also are carnivals. Okay? That carnival atmosphere of people yelling and screaming and doing cartwheels and running around and stuff, there are Baptist churches that are like that. And I'm going to be kicking a couple today, and if you don't have enough, you know, grace to understand this and, and you don't like being rebuked, well, that's your problem, you know. What I'm trying to get through to you today is you have to be very careful when a preacher starts to change his voice from his normal speaking voice. It's fine if you're upset about something, if you're really rebuking something, raise your voice. I'm not against that. But when a pastor starts to really put on the voice... And the way that he preaches, he's trying to deceive you. Okay? He's putting on a show, a carnival, according to the definition. Now we're going to look here at the 1828, Webster's 1828 Dictionary definition of carnival. It says here, quote, The feast or season of rejoicing before Lent observed in Catholic countries with great solemnity by feasts, balls, operas, concerts, uh, etc., so you see that thing there, way back in 1828, they recognized it. Yes, the Catholics were putting on carnivals. And the actual modern-day carnival was the, with the three-ring circus and the, you know, the elephants and the bears riding bicycles and whatever else, you know, trapeze artists and all that. That didn't come about till the 1800s, later on in the 1800s. Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary online here, the carnival. Uh, there's three definitions here which are very interesting. Uh, number one, a season or festival of merrymaking before Lent. So there you have that old 1828 
definition. Number two, an instance of merrymaking, feasting, or masquerading, an instance of riotous excess. Hmm, you see the dictionary definition is starting to change now. It's no longer the putting down of the flesh, it's now riotous excess. See, it's starting to change. Number three, now get this one. Think about this one with the modern day church. Quote, a traveling enterprise offering amusements, an organized program of entertainment or exhibition. What is the average modern church? It's exactly that, an organized program of entertainment. Dictionary definition here, people. We're dealing with science. This isn't my attitude or my opinion. The average modern church is an organized program of entertainment. They have the, the fast song when the people first come in to get them riled up, and then they play a slow song while they're taking the offering. <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a organized program of entertainment. That's what it is. Webster's 1955 New World Dictionary also has a perfect, uh, really good definition of carnival. It says here an entertainment with sideshows, rides, games, and refreshments, usually operated as a commercial enterprise sometimes by, by a social or charitable organization. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So I thought that was a very interesting uh, definition there. Again, compared to a modern church. Refreshments, operated as a commercial enterprise. The average modern church is a corporation. By definition, I'm not making that up. You know? Now, when you go to a circus, who's the guy that comes out? Comes out and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome you to this year's circus. And we, who's the guy? Ringleader, right? Mm hmm. What do you have at a church? A lot of these modern carnival churches. You have the preacher. Hmm. And this one's kind of interesting too. The definition for preacher. It says here, one who discourses publicly on religious subjects, one that inculcates anything with earnestness. So preachers don't appear just in churches. One that in inculcates anything with earnestness. So I'm going to play some uh, examples here of some preachers. Okay. Now I want you to notice something. What I'm going to be showing you, they're not all ministers of the gospel. These guys are going to be preachers from different things, but they're all using their voice. They're changing their voice from their normal speaking voice to lift up the flesh and to get a reaction from the people that are listening to them. So we're going to play this one here and see if you can pick this out. All right, here we go. We're going to listen to some preachers. And I call it like I see it, and I see it like I see it. And that's the way that it is, from the mat to the microphone. Ooh, yeah! Dig it! Those that talk about shattered, this precious gift, shattered. Tell me, shattered. Moses Manning, shattered. On Mount Sinai, shattered. As a flame of fire, shattered. Moses had an experience, shattered. With this gift of God, shattered. Another preacher. Now, for a lot of you people out there, that's a real hard nut to swallow. A lot of you don't like that. You don't like the prestige. That I have in life, you don't like the notoriety, you detest the fact that I got more cars than most of you have friends. I got a big house on the big side of town, I got life pretty much the way I want it. You understand that? You know why? Because <laughs> I'm the champ. <laughs> I'm the world's heavyweight wrestling champion. Here comes another preacher. Now, 
You say, oh, come on. You'd put a recording of Hitler in and call him a preacher? What's the dictionary definition? One that inculcates anything with earnestness. Did he do that? <clears throat> yeah. Did he get a reaction from his crowd? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about the two guys? That there were <clears> The <throat> first one was a professional wrestler. Then there was a black preacher. Then there was another professional wrestler. Then there was Adolf Hitler. What were they all doing? They all changed their voice to raise the flesh. That's what they did. Every single one of them. Okay? And a lot of preachers do the same thing. They change their voices to raise the flesh up. To get people interested. Alright, now we're going to actually hear from a supposed legitimate preacher. This guy's preaching in a Baptist church and I will apologize in advance because this guy sounds like a rusty chainsaw or something, you know, running at high RPM. I mean, he's pretty offensive to the ear. So, but listen, listen to what this guy's saying. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the brethren out there, when some preachers screaming and yelling and up there screaming, they, they say that that's the Holy Spirit. But this guy, when he's putting on his thing, when he's saying what he's going to say here, when you're going to hear it, he actually lies. He l comes right out and lies a very serious heresy. And I'm going to be exposing that heresy this morning. But listen to the modulated voice. Listen to it. And listen to what the guy's saying, if you can make it out. Okay, here we go. Don't talk about the man of God no more. Just go again. Get your hands off of him. It is a 100% guarantee. You lay your hand on the man of God, you got judgment coming to your house. It's a 100% guarantee. You lay your hand on the man of God, you got judgment coming down to your house tonight. Well, he's wrong. I don't care how wrong he is. You better keep your hands off the man of God. <laughs> oh boy, that guy could scream better than the professional wrestlers were doing. Isn't that something? Oh, but that's the Holy Spirit, brother. That's that's the Holy Spirit preaching through the guy. No, it isn't. It's flesh. That's what that is. And those guys that are, Amen, Amen, preach it, brother. You know what they're doing? They are amening a heresy. They are amening. Think about what the guy said to you. If you speak against the man of God, the preacher, if you say that he's wrong, that's wrong. God's going to bring judgment down to your house. So in other words, you're not allowed to speak against the pastor. That's not what the Bible teaches. Not at all. Okay, we're going to look up some scriptures here now. Numbers chapter 27. I'm going to go way back into the Old Testament. We're going to see some of the... What these guys do a lot of times is they, in their minds... They think that America is basically the new Israel. And so, you know, what it, what was going on there in the Old Testament, you can apply it to today. And, you know, we're the modern day Israel or something like this. I mean, that's what a lot of them think. Numbers chapter 27. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers 27, verse 15. <clears throat> now we're going to see how it started out here the thing of having a preacher this term the man of god is what we're going to be concentrating on this morning the man of god where the where did that come from all right numbers 27 verse 15 and moses spake unto the lord saying let the lord the god of the spirits of all flesh set a man over the congregation notice it says man there not woman <clears throat> or person, you know. Verse 17, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. 
and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He to have the oversight of the people. Verse 21, And he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation, and he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Now, are there some similarities to a modern-day New Testament preacher? Sure, absolutely. You see a lot of things there that can apply to a pastor today. No problem. All right? But you have to also recognize the differences here that God was dealing with the nation of Israel, and they had a tabernacle. There is no tabernacle today. Okay? Acts chapter 7 talks about that. Stephen actually was in the Jewish synagogue, you know, which is a type of the tabernacle there. Um, the tabernacle was movable. The synagogues were more, you know, they were fixed. But the point is, he was there in the synagogue and he was speaking to the people and they were upset because he was speaking against the synagogue. And what did he say? Acts chapter 7, he said, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. God no longer was dealing with that nation of Israel and saying, you have to have that synagogue, that holy place that you come to where you have the priest and the priest's office and everything. We're going to see this as we continue. So there is some instruction in righteousness there, but doctrinally you have to be very careful to go back here to Numbers to try and take this and say this is exactly the way we're supposed to do it today. I'm going to show you why it doesn't quite line up perfectly with the way we do it. Now we're going to go to the very first reference of the man of God in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 33. One book towards the back of your Bible there. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 1. <clears throat> we're going to see the very first time the law of first mention that the word man of God is used. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1. Okay, it says here, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Moses was the first man in your Bible to be called the man of God. Now, is a Christian pastor in the same office that Moses was? No. Moses had a very different calling. God did things through Moses. He did signs and wonders through Moses. You know, Moses and Aaron, when they went down to Egypt, they did a lot of miraculous things down there. They took the people out of Egypt. You know, instruction and in righteousness, you can make some application there. You can compare Moses to what a Christian pastor is supposed to do. But doctrinally, you have to be very careful. And when you start calling a Christian pastor the man of God and giving him this special office that can't be questioned, you're dealing in some very dangerous territory there. Okay? Papal infallibility is not a Bible doctrine. <laughs> okay? It's a Baptist doctrine. I mean, a Catholic doctrine. Excuse me. Watch out for that thing of a preacher being infallible. There's no such thing today. Now, let's look at another man of God. Turn a couple more chapters over to the book of Judges. Again, towards the back of the Bible, there, you know, going that direction. Judges chapter 13. And we're going to see something which really makes a problem for the uh, modern day Baptist, you know, man of God. Judges chapter. 13. Judges 13, verse 6. Let's look at another man of God. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me he his neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now dr now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat anything, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. 
Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Now, if you study the story out there, these are the parents of Samson. Samson in the Old Testament was a man that God used. He was a Nazarite, and he was very strong, did just amazing exploits. God used him. Okay, that's not here anymore. We don't have Nazarites anymore today. But notice there, again, what's the term man of God mean? Is it a reference to a preacher? No. It's a reference to an angel. An angel of God. Now I can tell you, a lot of these preachers are not angels. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. <laughs> so again, if you try and say, you're not to speak against the man of God and make, make it into a preacher today, see, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Because man of God does not always even refer to a person. Sometimes it refers to an angel. You've got to be very careful. Now we're going to go to First Chronicles. First Chronicles, uh, chapter 16. Now we're going to look at this thing, this teaching of don't touch the man of God. Don't you speak against the man of God. Where did this come from? We're going to see again, they, they steal verses from the Old Testament and apply them to a pastor today. There's a big problem there. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 21. Okay, it says here, um, He suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. See? Don't you touch the man of God. If you do, God's judgment's coming down. Well, what's the context? Is this talking about a Christian pastor? Look at uh, verse 13 there in chapter 16. Or, yeah, chapter 16, verse 13. O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even of the covenant which he made with Abraham, and of his oath with unto Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee, I will, will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance, when ye were but few, even a few, and strangers in it, and when they went from nation to nation, and from one kingdom to another people. Is he speaking to Christian pastors? No. He's speaking to Israel, to the nation of Israel. He's talking about a kingdom here. Okay, we're not building kingdoms today. We're not going from nation to nation and conquering them to make them Christian nations. Even though some people do believe that that's what we're doing. We're not. Okay, we're not supposed to do that. All right, we're to focus on heavenly things. Now this thing about touching not the Lord's anointed shows up again in Psalm 105 verses 14 through 15. We're not going to go there, but the same basic things shows up there. But now let's ask the question. Who are the anointed men of God? You know, the man of God. Who's the anointed man of God in the New Testament? Well, your Christian calling basically will happen in three steps. First of all, you have salvation and anointing. We're going to look at that. 1 John chapter 2. Back almost towards the end of the Bible. Way back. 1 John chapter 2 verse 26 is where we're going to go. We're going to see who in, the, in this passage here who was anointed. 1 John chapter 2 verse 26 and 27. Now, you're going to notice something very interesting here in verse 26. It kind of keys into what we're talking about today. It says here, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. You know what carnival preachers are supposed to, or what they're doing? A lot of times they're trying to seduce people through their stage voice. Verse 27, 
But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So in other words, Christian, if you are saved, you have the anointing. So, you know, you have the thing there they try to say in the Old Testament, touch not the Lord's anointed. Uh, well, that doesn't refer to the preacher. It refers to all Christians. As a Christian, you have the anointing. Okay? That's right there. The Lord will show you the truth. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Just a few books to the left of 1 John. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look here about this holy priesthood that we have today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Okay, it says here, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you are part of that holy priesthood. And the spiritual sacrifices that you offer up are things that you give away in your life. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says that you are to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Okay? What you give up for the Lord, your time, your money, your health sometimes if you're in, in ministry, those things that you give up, those are your spiritual sacrifices. Okay? Excuse me. Now look at verse 9. It says here, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So again, there you see the thing again of that holy priesthood, that royal priesthood it says there. It's interesting. If you're a Christian, you are part of royalty. You say, but what about the uh, holy nation? Well, our holy nation is New Jerusalem, which you can read about it in Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 23. Not going to go there this morning for sake of time. Now go another book over, James chapter 1, verse 5. So after your salvation and anointing, which comes upon you as the Holy Ghost comes upon you at salvation, the Holy Ghost doesn't come later. Okay, you don't have to get saved and then seek the Holy Ghost. That's heresy. You get saved. And the anointing comes upon you. You are a holy priest. Now, what's a holy priest have to do? Well, you have to have education. Okay? And then you say, well, then i go to got to go to a seminary or an accredited Bible college. No, you don't. You won't find that teaching in Scripture. What is true education? James chapter 1, verse 5. says here, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. When you first get saved as a Christian, you will lack wisdom. It's just a fact. Okay, Make sure that you ask God for that wisdom. You can go to a seminary and you can get a PhD, you can get a THD, a THM, and whatever else. And if you didn't ask God for that wisdom, that wisdom is useless. And there are a lot of men out there that go through their seminary training and they come out not knowing the Bible. All they know how to do is parrot what they've been taught. There's an awful lot of that. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to see a New Testament reference here to the term the man of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Okay, it says here, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, if you believe that the man of God is only the preacher, then that does that mean that only the preacher is to be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works? No. See, that's heresy. To take a pastor, a man that's up there preaching to you, and to say, he's the man of God and I'm not. That's wrong. Okay, and you say, what about women? How can a woman be a man of God? Well, the term man is in, is in, is in kind of a reference to mankind. Okay, the Bible talks in, in Peter there, the one part about, you know, that the woman's dress in modest apparel and, and the hidden man of the heart. 
you know, talk, speaking about women, you know, a woman has Jesus Christ within her. Now, a woman's not supposed to be a pastor to oversee the flock, but a woman is supposed to have understanding and knowledge of the Bible. And right there, it talks about it. See the corruption of this thing? You take, you steal stuff from the Old Testament where God is dealing with one nation, the nation of Israel. You steal that stuff and you say, that man of God back then, like Moses, which God chose to bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt, I'm going to take that reference and I'm going to apply it to this reference right here. And I'm going to say, the preacher is the man of God and you better not speak against the man of God because touch not the Lord's anointed. See how this stuff gets so screwed up? And that's what they do. And they use it to lord over the people. You get some guy that's up there, doesn't know his Bible. He's been through seminary, had his mind messed up. And he gets up there and he's preaching heresy. And some Bible believer in the, in the congregation says, uh, excuse me, what you just said there was wrong. How dare you speak against the man of God? Who are you to speak against the man of God? It's nonsense. But you see, you do it, you stand up there and you scream and you yell and you get the congregation all riled up. You, you know, they're all yelling, Amen, preaching, Amen. You get them all riled up and you stand up there and you preach lies to them. But you do it with that voice, that stage voice to get their flesh riled up, to get them like a pep rally. Watch out for that stuff. I'm telling you, this country is covered with that. And a lot of these big, you know, Militant Baptist churches down south, they are really guilty of that. Okay? Some of those Baptist churches, man, phew, I wouldn't walk in them for if you paid me to go in them. I mean, where's the scripture at for denominations? Now, your Christian calling, salvation and anointing, true education. Third, you have the ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five, verses seventeen through twenty-one. I'm going to hit those verses quick here. You're going to see the thing of the ministry that's been uh, given to you as a Christian. All right, here, verse seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As, that, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Does it say that only pastors are given the word of reconciliation? No. That verse applies to all Christians. Watch out for that thing of, you know, only the pastor has certain powers and authorities. And you say, well, then we don't need pastors. No, the Bible doesn't teach that either. There are some of the brethren out there in the house church movement uh, that say that there is no, the office of pastor is not there. That's not true. All right, First Peter chapter five. <clears throat> First Peter chapter five. We're going to look at verses one through four. First Peter chapter five, verse one. Now there are different names for pastors in the in your New Testament here: pastors, uh, bishops, elders. You know the the word deacon is different. It's it's not the same as a bishop. You can read about that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But it says here, verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There's the job of your New Testament pastor. Feed the flock of God and take the oversight. 
Okay, that's my job here as the pastor of Bible Believers Fellowship. You come here, my job is to feed you the Word of God, to prepare sermons. Okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. And unfortunately, a lot of preachers out there are not doing that. They are not feeding their flock. But you're also to take the oversight thereof. What does that mean? That means, okay, if I see some problems out there, things, excuse me, things getting chaotic or disorganized or people acting up and whatever, it's my job to say, hey, okay, calm down. It's time that the service is supposed to start now. Sit down, be quiet, you know. Whatever, I'm to take the oversight thereof. It's not just to be a free-for-all where everybody's allowed to do whatever they want. There's to be decency and order within a church service. Okay, that's supposed to be there, and that's the job of the pastor. The pastor is not supposed to be lording over. It says there, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And in samples, another word for example there in your Bible, I'm supposed to be live as an example all of you okay but i'm not supposed to be a lord over you i'm not supposed to come in you know i, I played a little joke on the people here this morning i i wore this robe this phd robe you shouldn't be doing things like that i did it as a joke but there are people that do that and they're serious they preach in a robe and the people come up to them and it's a oh, whole oh, pastor oh you know they like bow down before him or something that's not right that's wrong when you start to worship a pastor and, you know, I don't believe either in the thing of the title pastor. Pastor is a, is a description of what you're supposed to be doing, but going around saying, yes, hello, I'm the pastor, Brian Denlinger. No, 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 no. Don't call me that. You know, when you write to me or whatever, just say Brian or Mr. Denlinger or whatever. You know, don't call me pastor. You know, that's, I don't like that title stuff. And especially then you get into the thing of reverend. You know, then you're really going off the deep end. Or the reverend doctor, you know, or some some of these things but now you see there the thing about an elder feeding the flock taking the oversight thereof not as being neither as being lords over god's heritage but being in sample to the flock now are you supposed to submit to the pastor to the man of god quote unquote look at verse five likewise ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder <clears throat> so yeah you are but continue yea all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The pastor is not to be a lord over God's heritage. The pastor is to be an example to the flock, an example. Excuse me. But you're all to be subject one to another. You know, if you go back to the Gospels there, Jesus said about, He that's greatest among you, let him be the servant of all. That's the job of a pastor. Take the oversight, feed the flock, but don't become a lord over the heritage, over God's heritage there. You've got to be real careful about that. Now, <clears throat> I want to warn about this, and I've warned about this. Uh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Now, are you allowed to correct the pastor? Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy five verse seventeen. So we're going to go next. That guy said in the in earlier on there. He said, you know, don't touch the man of God. You know, don't speak against the man of God kind of thing. And he and he said, well, he's wrong. I don't care if he's wrong. You know, get your hands off the man of God. You know. And I actually I actually wrote a comment on one of these videos. These bad attitude Baptist guys. And, you know, I said the guy didn't even use much scripture and he was just just a jerk the whole way through the, the sermon. And somebody wrote and they said, you're not to speak against the man of God. And I said, well, there's a problem with that, you see, because I'm a pastor too. <laughs> so can a man of God speak against another man of God? <laughs> see the absurdity of that? But let's look here at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. It says here, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, a real preacher is one that will labor, labor in the word and doctrine. 
Okay, that's very important. Now, if you have a preacher that's reading three or four verses of Scripture and then spending the rest of his time telling stories, he's not laboring in the Word. A real good sermon, there will be a lot of Scripture. Okay? And there are some, there are some very good sermons. I've put some occasionally I find a good one and I put it on our website there kjvbbf.com in the video sermons area there are some good sermons out there but watch out for it when you get a preacher that stands up and he's yelling and screaming and putting on a show and everybody and, the, and he's getting the congregation all riled up and he's not using the scripture watch out for that you want to have a guy that's reading scripture and that's quoting scripture okay and a lot of times, by the way, when these guys start their screaming and their yelling and stuff, and you actually start to examine what they're preaching, a lot of times it's heresy that they're saying. It's not the Holy Spirit getting them to yell, in other words. It's their own flesh. And uh, you say, well then, uh, you know, should we judge what they're saying? Should the congregation sit there and judge what the preacher's saying? Yeah, absolutely. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11 says... And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, Paul and Silas, you know, Paul was an apostle, and he was doing the sign gifts of the, of the apostles. I mean, he's about as Christian as you're going to get, and yet those believers in Berea were still judging him. They were still searching the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They didn't just sit there like, you know, brainwashed imbeciles or something, just sitting there, uh, just nodding their head to everything that they heard. They searched the Scriptures daily. Okay? This might shock you, but I'm not perfect. Okay? I can make mistakes. That's why you need to know your Bible. And that's why you it's it's just so important to understand this book. Now I can feed you and stuff. There are other preachers out there that can feed you, but you have to go back to the Bible and you have to judge everything I say, everything any other preacher says, by this book. And when you get some guy standing up and saying, Don't you question me, don't you dare speak against me, because if you do, God's gonna judge you, you're not dealing with the Christian ministry there. The guy might be saved, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you're dealing with heresy at that point. Watch out for that thing that we heard earlier from that guy. And by the way, another thing I'll mention here before we continue. Another dangerous thing about these big church buildings, you get this big crowd of people and they all start yelling, Amen, Amen, preach it, brother. There's a very unique thing with us as people. It's called group think. All right, there. I mean, this is a scientific thing, a scientific reality. When you get a lot of people together... They're, those people are susceptible to doing what everybody else is doing. You know, there's a, I saw a video the one time they did this, you know, funny video over in Japan. This whole crowd of people, you know, they see some guy walking down the street and this whole crowd of people goes walking up and kind of surrounds him and, and they have it timed at a certain instant. They all scream and hit the ground. And you know what happens to the guy that's walking that's not aware of what's going on? He hits the ground too. Why? Well, because all the other people did it. See? That's why the Lord likened us to sheep. I mean, I've told this story before. Back when I was a, a young man, I'd go hunting, and there was a pasture way back in the hills where I lived. And I'd come upon the pasture, and I'd see this, you know, herd of sheep there, or flock, whatever you want to call it. And one of them would see me, and he'd, you know, and he'd take off running, and the whole flock would go right with him. Many of them didn't even see me. But you see, all the other sheep are running, so I guess I should run too. See, that's the danger of these church buildings. Because you get the people all riled up and everybody else is doing it, so I guess it must be right. They stop reading their Bible, they stop judging according to the Scriptures, and they just go along with the herd mentality. Be careful. Be very careful. Now look at verse 19. 1 Timothy 5.19 you say, can you accuse an elder? Absolutely. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. 
Now, a couple things there. You need two or three witnesses before you can accuse an elder. Don't be real quick to accuse an elder. Don't be real quick to nail a preacher, okay, in the sense of, you know, really rebuking him openly. Okay, now notice, too, there it says, them that sin rebuke before all. It doesn't say them that I disagree with or whatever. If you, I mean, there are some areas of disagreement that you can, you know, whatever, you can have with a pastor, fine. Okay, um, you need to have a little bit of grace there. But if a pastor's in sin, you have to say, you know, there are other brethren that are seeing this stuff going on. You have to go, I mean, first go to the pastor and say to him, hey, you know, we kind of saw you doing this or that or whatever. We have noticed this or that, you know, brother so-and-so here and, and this other brother here, you know, we saw the same thing. You kind of need to get that cleaned up if the pastor says, no, no, don't talk to me about it. You know, who are you to speak against the man of God? <laughs> well, then you need to rebuke him before all. You see, like I said earlier, I'm not infallible. I'm not inerrant. Okay, and I need to be held to a standard, and all preachers need to be held to a standard, that if they sin, I can't be up here, you know, getting away with it. And the people can't let me get away with it. You have to rebuke me before all. And it says there that others also may fear. Okay? A pastor is not above reprove or rebuke. Now, we're going to go back to another one of these, uh, this same guy again. I'll apologize in advance. <laughs> we're going to go back to it again. Gotta pull this up. Okay, here's a second one. I prayed for everything that I could think of, and I got rest in God. I don't know nothing else to say to you. I've been been here for a while. I said I ain't got nothing else to say to you. But that old man of God said I need to pray through. I've tried my best, and boy, about two more minutes into praying like that, I entered somewhere I'd never been. Glory to God, brother Hewitt. Laying in that clubhouse, I felt somebody lay a hand on my shoulder. I stopped praying and looked around, and they weren't nobody in there. I'm talking about praying through. Somebody needs to pray through. Glory to God, we need to pray through. Yes, sir, yeah. Now, when you say amen, that means truth. He just lied. Okay? He was praying through, and all of a sudden, God left heaven, left everything he's doing. He said, hold on, everybody. You know, I can't run the universe right now. i got to get down and put my hand on the guy's shoulder. I mean, come on, people. Don't fall for this stuff. But see, he's getting the people. You didn't see the video there. But, I mean, he's he's running around and jumping up and down. And he's grabbing people in the congregation and shaking them as he's doing that. And they're all amening him. Not even true what he's saying. And, by the way, if he did pray through, like he said, and somebody put their hand on him, you know, in an invisible thing, how, do you, how does he know it wasn't a devil? you got to be real careful about that stuff. You shouldn't be seeking to have physical contact with the spirit realm. That's very, very, very dangerous. And, you know, of course, you got the screaming there again going on. I mean, he can out-scream a professional wrestler. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyhow, now we got two more, and then we're going to be done here with listening to these nuts. We're going to hit a couple more scriptures, and then we're finished. Now, I want you to notice the similarities between the two upcoming, quote-unquote, preachers. Remember, anybody that inculcates anything with earnestness, with with public discourse for any reason. That's a preacher, according to the dictionary definition. Now, I want you to notice two things. Both of them are going to talk fast, and they will change the pitch of their voice for effect. I want you to notice that. And both of them want your money. Notice that, too. Here we go. And, again, we're dealing with science here, people. Listen to the way they do this. 
Race fans, the U.S. Hard Rock Football Drag Racing Championships blast in the Baltimore Arena this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Monster trucks go to war, climbing and crushing around the cars, including Bigfoot. Hot Rod Mudball drag racing funny cars down and dirty in the bog. From the 23rd century comes Gloria, Gloria, a 200 mile per hour jet dragster, two story tall transforming robot. Get your tickets now. Baltimore Arena box office and all ticket center outlets this Friday and Saturday, 8 p.m. Sunday, 2 p.m. Baltimore Arena. It's the wildest show on wheels. wheels, wheels, wheels. That's the first preacher. Here's the second one. You don't know, do you? All right, never mind. We won't go there. All right, we're going to give a big old howdy ho to Gary Cribben, all the way from Ireland, on the count of three. One, two, three. Howdy ho, Gary Cribben. Yeah, you know, for Floyd, he tailed it in there. He's got it going there. <laughs> and we don't only start with the howdy ho. We start off with a current topic. And, of course, our current topic, boy, with some recent legislation. We've been waiting all week to get to this. We are back on the issue of the mark of the beast. That thing just doesn't seem to go away, okay? And as we saw before, there are many times, I'm not going to turn there again, Revelation 13 is the classic text there, and it clearly says that the Antichrist, with the false prophet, the false prophet working with him, is going to dupe everybody on the planet. Literally is the key word that we're going to see there, is once again, force everyone on the planet, rich or uh, poor, small or, or, or uh, big, whatever, uh, fr free, it doesn't matter. Everybody on the planet is going to get a mark on their right hand or the forehead to buy and sell stuff. But I don't know about you, Mike, we see no signs of people getting some sort of mark on uh, their bodies to in order to make purchases, do we? Uh, okay. And I call it like oh. I see it. <laughs> Went back to the beginning again. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, the first one there, of course, was a, a uh, you know, mud bog and all the stuff there. You heard that monster truck rally. Second one was a modern preacher called Billy Crone. Billy Crone uh, attacked the King James Bible. I made some videos exposing the guy, I mean, total heretic, and people get all upset, you know, oh, how dare you attack our favorite preacher, you know. He's got an effective ministry. No, he's got an effective business, okay? And he didn't just have too much coffee just that morning or something there, you know. <laughs> he talks that way all the time. Okay, I've seen a couple of his messages. I can't stomach very much of it, but the guy just is a mile a minute. And he, he's doing a thing. I mean, did you notice there? You know, we're going to be talking about the mark of the beast. Why would you do that as a preacher? That's not a funny thing. It's a very scary thing. It's a very bad thing. But he changes the pitch of his voice. Okay, and, and it's funny there, when it came time to quote scripture, he couldn't even quote it. You know, he uses... 8 million different versions, but, you know, the point is he couldn't quote anything there. We're going to see about what he was saying there. Revelation chapter 13. I mean, you could go through this guy's messages that he speaks, and you could just debunk a lot of what he's saying. Some of what he says is true, you know. Uh, rat poison is predominantly good food, with just a little bit of poison mixed in, you know. I'm not saying everything the guy says is wrong, but I'm just saying you got to watch out for that. And you see what happens a lot of times is these guys, they talk so fast and they say, you know, we're going to turn to the book of Revelation blah, 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 and they talk so fast. You say your mind goes, wait a second, that didn't sound right, but he's moved on to the next point. There's no time to stop and think. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 18. Okay, it's, he said there that uh, the key word there is force. All right. We're going to see what that key word really is according to the Bible. Revelation 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So there you have it. Two, two lies that he said. He did, the key word there is not force, it's calls. Okay? The Antichrist isn't going to have to force people to take the mark of the beast. Because it's going to be, there's the mark, if you want to buy or sell, take it. If not, that's okay. You'll starve to death. See? You don't have to force anybody to do that then. You don't have to force them to take the mark of the beast. You cause people to take the mark of the beast 
but the word force isn't even in the text. <coughs> now, Billy Croon uses new versions, so he might have got that from a new version. But the point is, <coughs> it's not the Holy Spirit causing him to speak like that and everything. You know, he's not speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's his own words, okay, to get the people riled up. That's what they do. The second thing he says, he says that the mark is on the hand or forehead. The Bible doesn't say that. It says in. Very important distinction there. And it's funny because he goes into the thing of the implantable microchips. If you watch that video on Revelation there. So it's like you just said the Bible says that he gets... He call, or forces everybody to get the mark on the hand or on the forehead. And then he says, here's proof of the mark of the beast. And they're showing people getting chips put in their body. It's like, if you just stick with the King James Bible, you know, it'd come out right. But you see, if he stuck with the King James Bible, he wouldn't make as much money. See, he wouldn't be a good carnival preacher. In other words. <clears throat> now, in conclusion here, we're going to look at what is true biblical preaching. Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> Acts chapter 15, verse 35. <clears throat> okay, Acts chapter 15, verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Mark left off when, they, when he should have been working. Uh, verse 39, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and called unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Okay, Paul went out to confirm the churches. Now, did Paul and Silas... And these guys, did they, did they preach by screaming at the people? And by the way, there you had two men of God, and they had an argument, and it was so bad that they actually split up. So you, if you think that Christians are all going to be united and everything like that, uh-uh, not going to happen. Two men that had the Holy Spirit just, you know, powerful on them, Paul and Barnabas, and yet they had an argument and split up. Hmm. But how did Paul preach? Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 6. That we're going to read. It says here, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to, depart, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Will that be a service? Okay, verse 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching... He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. <clears throat> Paul, I guess, wasn't very exciting. You know, he was just long preaching until midnight. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. <laughs> so Paul, first he's preaching to midnight, and the poor guy, he falls out of the third floor, you know, bang, down, and Paul goes down. Oh, he's all right, get him back up to the service. I'm not done preaching yet. <laughs> and he preaches till the break of day. How many churches today do that kind of thing? Hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now, 
They say, well, that was awful. The guy would fall asleep under the anointed preaching of Paul. Well, Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 says, And further, by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. When you listen to hours and hours and hours of preaching, your flesh will wear out. Okay? Your flesh will not be exalted. Your flesh will not be raised up. It won't be a carnival experience. <laughs> Unless you go with that one definition where the flesh is torn down. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter two. Be the last place we're going to turn to this morning. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse four. You say, Oh, I don't know, brother. I think that Paul was really rough and he really you know, gave it to him and really preached hard to him and everything and yelled and screamed and and got the people all riled up. Well, let's see about that. Let's see. Let's search search the scriptures to see if those things are so. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse four. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. You know these guys have put on a big performance. They're doing it to please men. I didn't have that part in the video, but that guy that we listened to earlier that was yelling and screaming, you know, we got to pray through and all that stuff. You know what he would do? I watched a lot of his preaching. He'd do that and he'd go, he'd take his hand and he'd go like this when they were amening him. Like, give me more, 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 more. Yeah, that's exactly what he was doing. It was a carnival. Come on, let's get it riled up. You better amen me. Can you say amen? What they're doing. They're getting everything wrought up. They're pleasing men. They're putting on a show. They're putting on a performance. Verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. You can preach in a certain way to get people's money. And the best way to do it is to change your voice. Maybe even throw in a little bit of tears, you know, a little bit of crying, you know. I have such a burden for people for lost souls, but we just, the giving hasn't been up this month. And oh, if we only could have another thousand dollars from every individual, you know, then we could get the work of the Lord done. Oh, the burden. See, I can fake it. I mean, if I, if I didn't fear God, if I was an atheist, you know, I had a brother write to me. I was, we were writing back and forth about the faith healers. And he said, if I was an atheist, he said, I'd be a faith healer. If I had no fear of God or didn't believe in God, I'd be a faith healer because you can make a lot of money. Yeah, that's true. These faith healer guys, they're making millions of dollars a year. It's just, just disgusting. Verse 6, here in First Timothy, or, or sorry, First Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now look at verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Hmm. Isn't that something? And you get a lot of these guys that do the preaching, you know, and they say, oh, you get some guy up there that's just reading out of the Bible. He's a sissy. Well, Paul preached as a nurse cherisheth her children. Okay? Be careful about these guys screaming at you. Now, verses 8 and 9, we'll read there yet, and then we're, we'll tie this thing up. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Sometimes a brother should preach and not ask the people for money. Paul often did that. There were some churches that could support him, and he took money from them, and he said, thank you. There are other times, no. He didn't take money from them. He didn't want to be chargeable to any of them. New Testament preaching and pastors are very different from your modern 501c3 incorporated CEOs. And you think I'm kidding. You know, people get mad at me. They say, oh, you're a heretic, and you're sarcastic, and whatever. I'm telling the truth. They are 501c3 corporations and the pastor is the CEO. 
I'm telling you the truth. You can check it out if you're going to one of these churches. They are after your money. And they come, they put on an organized program of entertainment to get your money. And unfortunately, it used to be that, you know, the, the independent fundamental Baptist churches they talk about, they were the, the hardcore ones that stuck to it. They're putting on shows just like the modern churches are. Don't think that, well, I can be safe by going to one of those churches, but I just will avoid the modern churches. They're both putting on the shows. You need to stay with this book. That's a very, very important thing to do. Now, I want to conclude here by just saying a couple things. Number one, I'm not against a preacher raising his voice if it's in the right context. Not at all. You know, there are some preachers that get very passionate. They yell about some kind of thing, you know, yell about abortion or yell about pornography or whatever, some evil. That's fine. I'm not against that if it's in the right context. But when a church turns, when a church meeting, the people come together and it turns into a circus, people running around and screaming. I mean, I've seen stuff, people getting up, the one guy got up and he pulled his tie off and he's screaming and, and flailing around his head. And I'm supposed to believe that's the Holy Spirit? It's not the Holy Spirit, it's flesh. Some guy getting up and he's screaming and running around the church, the congregation. I've heard of guys, you know, preaching and stuff, and, and the people in the congregation start screaming and throwing hymn books and stuff. I mean, it's insane. Some of the stuff that passes for a quote-unquote church. And they say, that's the Holy Spirit, brother. No, it isn't. It's the flesh. You don't see any of that stuff here in the Bible. Okay? Be very careful about that stuff. A true preacher will use lots of Scripture. Okay? You exalt the Word of God. You magnify the Word of God, not yourself. It's okay to throw in a couple little stories here and there. That's fine. But you need to be based, basing your, your sermon on Scripture. A pr true preacher will seek to impart biblical understanding to others. Feeding the flock so they can go out and feed other people. A true preacher will not lord over people, but will encourage them to be in ministry themselves. A true preacher won't say, well, you have to come to me, you know, to understand this stuff. No, he'll say, hey, I'll, I'll give you a book, or I'll give you a video, or I'll explain it myself, or whatever. That's the job of a true preacher. A true preacher will not be afraid of a good scriptural rebuke. Now, if you're listening to this this morning, and you made it this far, and you're one of these big mouth Baptists, or big mouth whatevers, you know, I pick on the Baptists because they're one of the few churches out there that stands by the King James Bible. And a lot of people think, well, then they're good. Well, not necessarily, not all the time. And if you're one of those and you're offended by what I've said because I've kicked some of your heroes, well, you know, deal with it. <laughs> a true preacher will not try to steal verses from the Old Testament priesthood to avoid getting kicked occasionally. Okay, every Christian today is part of the royal priesthood, the priesthood of the believer, that we are all men of God. Okay, watch out for that thing. A true preacher is his own man and not a parrot. Okay, you got to get your relationship with the Lord figured out between you and him and not just repeat what you've been told by other men. A true preacher will not be a man pleaser. Okay, now many preachers today are going to stand, you know, they'll stand against things like sodomy, liberalism, abortion, whatever. But how many are going to stand against things like the Jesuits or the seminaries or the New Versions, 501c3 Church Incorporation, television, feminism, or any other hot topic? A lot of them don't. Why? Well, because a carnival atmosphere in your church will get you a lot of money. But when you say things that make people uncomfortable... Well, the giving can often go down. And a lot of these preachers, they don't want that. Okay? So I just did that. I wanted to put this thing together because, you know, Jesus Christ said about the end times, He said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in My name. And, you know, they say, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Be very careful. Okay? Don't let yourself fall for this thing of that adrenaline-based church experience. And by the way, you say, well, I, I don't know, brother. I, I think that they're, they're holy men of God and you, you're speaking against men of God right now. Okay, by their fruits ye shall know them. What fruits are these churches producing? Obviously, we know the fruits of the modern churches, but what about the ones, the, these big you know, carnival churches that they got the people, the preacher up there screaming and yelling and stuff like that? Do those people, do they have 
less sin. No, oftentimes they're just the same as the world. They can yell and scream and amen and everything a sermon, but a lot of times they're very they're just as wicked as anybody else. So I encourage brethren to listen to a lot of different preaching, a lot of different sermons. But when you get some guy screaming at you, you need to be very careful because it's very easy to be deceived at that point in time. All right, and it's not going to get any better. <laughs> There's just going to be more of these screamers coming out all the time. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.